There is so many, many, many people who think God has given them the Holy Spirit to sit in church and not given the Holy Spirit to set the captives free. Welcome to this series called Fighting for the True Gospel. I am very, very excited to be back with you and to do the next teaching in the series about the Holy Spirit. Yes, we are going to look at the Holy Spirit this time. And I'm excited. I'm very, very excited. When I was preparing this teaching yesterday, I just felt something was stirring up in me. I, I felt it. It was so unique. And I just felt it the deeper I went into it. I just felt it. And I was like, whoa, what is happening here? God, there is something. Holy Spirit, you are real. I, I, and You know, I know that the Holy Spirit is real, but faith comes by hearing by the word of God. And it stirred something up in me. And I went for a long walk and prayed afterward. And, and it was just so special yesterday when I prepared. And I did not know... I, I was not aware that it was actually Pentecost yesterday. <laughs> it was the day of Pentecost. We were celebrating that, people were celebrating that yesterday, but I was not aware it was that day. And it, it just became so special for me, all, all that happened yesterday. And now I'm here to share it with you. In this series, Fighting for the True Gospel, we have been looking at faith, what is true faith, Repentance, what is true repentance, and baptism water, what is true baptism water. And I've got amazing feedback. And I know the last teacher about the baptism in water was very, very long, over two hours. But I just got so, 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 uh, so how to say it? The word just brought so much excitement in me when I was doing the teaching. And I just keep going, keep going, keep going. And, and, and the word, brought life and I actually needed to ask forgiveness after that teaching that that I have been a little uh, slaggy when it comes to the baptism in water and people will be su surprised when they hear that because Tom you, you are really talking a lot about baptism water yeah but try to listen to the teaching try to see what the word is truly saying about it then you will like me oh God help us help us we need to come back to this even more than we have ever done before. Today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and it's not going to be so long teaching two hours. I'm actually going to do two teachings this time about the Holy Spirit. The first teaching here, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus, what the Holy Spirit did in Jesus' life. And we're going to look at Christ. We're going to look at Jesus and the Holy Spirit in him and what Jesus was doing by the Spirit and also what he was teaching about the Spirit, and then we are going to end today with Pentecost, how the Holy Spirit came there. And then next time, we are going to look at Pentecost and forward, how the Holy Spirit was working in the early disciples. And then we are going to look at more practical, how do it look in your life and my life today? Because this is not just about doctrines. And, and I... I When I see churches today where there's people who clearly don't have the Holy Spirit, and that provoke people, and I say like that, but this is happening, who don't have the Holy Spirit, and people who do not walk in the Spirit, who don't see the power of the Spirit, standing and talking about the Spirit like, like something. Like I grew up in a Lutheran church in Denmark, and they talked about the Holy Spirit. But they don't talk about the Holy Spirit as a reality in their life. They talked about the Holy Spirit as something that happened many years ago. And this is not what I want to come with here, just theology. We are going to look at the word, but this has to be a reality in our life. We need to experience it in our life. Since I did the last video on the baptism in water, they have gone over two months. Why? Because not that I haven't um, wanted to do this teaching, but I've just been on the road. Some of you know it. We took a road trip, me and my family, across America from Florida to California to Washington and cross over again. 46 days. We baptized over 250 people. We saw so many healed, so many set free. We saw 
the Holy Spirit led us. Like when I was in in what in, in California, I actually we were supposed to go home directly, but then I got a vision and the Holy Spirit led me, like we saw in Paul, he experienced go to Macedonia. The Holy Spirit led me and said, Go to Seattle, Washington. And there was like 18 hours extra driving up there and extra that way. And now that was not part of our program. But we went up there and there was basically one man, a pastor up there, who contacted me. And we met before the meeting started. And I said, God said that I should come here because somebody was in help, need of help. And I believe it was that pastor. And we spent our evening together and he came to the Keystar later. And he wrote to me a few days ago that the church are being transformed. They are doing disciple groups. They are seeing so much fruit. And he just thanked me so much for coming there. But that was a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led me. So this is for us today. What I'm going to do this teaching compared to the other teachings, I'm trying to put scripture in here in front of me so you can read the scripture yourself together with me while I'm doing the teaching. But I also want to say to you, take the Bible, take the word of God, read it, have a pen, write under, write it, write comments, get the word in. Why? Don't be deceived. It's so clear. I had a guy writing to me a few days ago on Facebook. He wrote, Tom is a heretic. Okay. So he thought I was a heretic. He's not the first one who thought that. But then I went in to look at his Facebook profile. Who is that guy? And he was an orthodox Christian. And of course he believed I'm a heretic. According to his theology, I am a heretic. But according to mine and many other people in theology, he is a heretic. Don't just believe because I say it. And don't just throw it away because other people say that I'm preaching a heretic. Because what do the words say? Every church denomination, everything you grow up in, you think everyone else is a heretic. Everyone else are preaching false. But we all need to take a time to examine the scripture ourselves. And I want to just go through scripture with you now so you can see it's not just my words. So, uh, but this is what the word is saying. So I hope you're ready to go with me through scripture to look at the Holy Spirit and I'll take the teaching and share something uh, and, and get more life on it and flesh and make it more easy to receive for us who live today. Let's start with Jesus. Always when we talk about theology, no matter what we talk about, Always look at Jesus first. That is a good way to go. If we look at Jesus in Matthew 3, we can read about how Jesus got baptized. And we read here, Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to hinder him, saying, I need to be baptized for you, and you come to me. Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water and that moment heaven opened and he saw the spirit of God descended like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love within him. I'm well pleased. So here we see that Jesus got baptized in water. As soon as he came out of water, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. Or here is written the Spirit of God. That is another word for the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. So here in Matthew 3, Jesus received the Holy Spirit. Got baptized by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon him. To use three different words for the, for the same thing. From that moment on, we read that Jesus' life changed. Jesus' life changed. And that is what the Holy Spirit do. When you receive the Holy Spirit, when you get baptized, when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, your life is going to change. The next thing that happened, we read that, especially also in Matthew 4, we read this line here. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. So Jesus was led by the Spirit. 
you don't read that in Jesus' life like that before, led by the Spirit. But now the Spirit was working in Jesus' body, like the Spirit wants to work in your body and my body today. And like Jesus was led by the Spirit, we today also need to be led by the Spirit. Like I was led by the Spirit to go to Seattle, Washington to meet a guy there. Jesus was led by the Spirit to go to the wilderness. And there he got tempted. And when he came out there, things just changed right away. When he came out of the desert, we read from Matthew 4, 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of God have come near. So from that time on, after Jesus received the Holy Spirit and went to that uh, temptation and that fasting, Jesus started to preach, repent for the kingdom of God is near. But Jesus did not only repent or preach with words. It was not only words he came with. And in Luke 4, 14, we read this. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And this is what we see. When the Holy Spirit comes over somebody, they should be led by the Spirit and they should walk in the power of the Spirit. And Jesus was walking in the power of the Spirit. You saw that in Jesus' life. Healing, deliverance, miracles. It was all the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is for you and me today. And I want us to already, before we move on and look at Jesus, you have to understand that when we read Jesus, now us who are born again, we are in Christ. Or Christ in us by His Spirit, if you have received the Holy Spirit. We are the disciples. He's the master. A disciple should become like his master. Jesus has shown us how we should live. So when you look at Christ, you can look at the woman who touched Jesus and felt a power, and a power went out of Jesus into her and healed her. You can see that and you can think, oh, if we can just touch Jesus like this. But we should also read it like, hey, but Christ is now in me. What if people touch me and a power go into them and heal them? Because we are Christ's body here on earth. And I'm not saying something like, hey, who do you think you are being proud? No, Jesus was humble and we should also be humble. That is one of the fruit of the Spirit. But we should... When we look at Christ, understand that Christ is showing us how we as his body should live. He's the head. We are the body. The body will be the head. We are his ambassador to represent him, him here on earth. He have not, he, he, let's say like that, as the father sent him, he had now sent us. So when we read about this, we look at our master and who we want, who we should try to imitate. And uh, so remember that when we go on and look at Jesus. So Jesus, he came in the power of the Holy Spirit out of the desert. The first thing he did was he went to his own city, Nazareth. And Nazareth, he came on the Sabbath and he took the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he started to read. And he read this from Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach good tithing to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And Jesus then read that, sat down again, and then he said, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then he went out and did it right away. So what he said here, he continued doing. The next thing we read in Luke 4 is that he actually healed a man with an unclean spirit, a man who was bound, a man who was captured. He said 
him free. And we can read this in, in verse 32. And they were amazed at his teaching because he words have authority. So Jesus spoke with authority, but there's more. Verse 36, we read here, what words are these? With authority and power, he gave orders to impure spirit and they come out. So Jesus walked with authority. He spoke with authority. He walked in power. Power of the Holy Spirit. What Jesus did here, what we saw in Jesus' life and how he continued. And the next thing we read in Luke 4 is that many people got healed. What we see here is a work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus. I also say in another way, way, we, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we should be led by the Spirit and we should walk in the power of the Spirit. We should walk in authority and unclean demons will listen to us. And this is what it should look like. We are in Christ's place. We are his body. He's our master. And the kingdom of God is not only words. The kingdom of God is power. And we see that. And next time we are going to look at Paul and Peter and the rest of the early church there. But just take Paul now. Just take one verse here. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, 3, he said this. I came to you in weakness with great fear and tremble. My was for my message and my preaching was not with wise and persuaded words, but with demonstration of the Spirit's power. Paul, he said, when I came to you, I did not come with words, with wise words and persuaded words. But I came with demonstration of the Spirit's power, of the power of the Holy Spirit. It was in Jesus' life and, and it was in Paul's life and Peter's life and the early church. But you saw already at that time that what Jesus was doing, you, you saw something different in the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they had the word. Word, 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 but it was not... True word. They were deceived. They did not have the true gospel. They did not speak with authority. And they did not walk in the power of the Spirit. They did not come with demonstrations of the Spirit. Like many churches today. And, and you can choose to build on theology and what you have told with wise words and persuasive words, but you can also build on the power, the demonstration and the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way Paul said, I came to you with great fear and tremble, was that he knew that he was dependent on the Holy Spirit in his life. Like people, can, people, there's people who are very gifted. They can stand up and preach and they can say, yeah, all honor to God, all glory to God. And, and, and I, I come in fear and tremble because I know it's only God who do that to me. But come on, they can preach. It's a gift. Many people can preach in their own strength. But try to heal the sick and cast out demons in your own strength. Try to do the power, see the demonstration of the power of the spirit in your own strength. You cannot. And that is where God wants you and me to live. He wants to have us to live in a place of dependence of the Holy Spirit. So we live in weakness with fear and tremble because we know that we need the Spirit to come with demonstration. And if the Spirit don't come, nothing will happen. So I just want to encourage you and say, this is the Word of God and we need it. Don't build on theology. Don't listen to those people out there, to be honest, who just have words, 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 and there is no demonstration. There is a lot of words of wisdom, wise words, wise words, and persuading words. And we need good words, but we also need the power we read here, the demonstration at the, and the Spirit's power, the power of the Holy Spirit. So what we read Jesus was saying here in Luke 4, 18 is something you and me 
should be able to say today. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he have anointed me to preach good tithing to the poor, preach good news to the poor. He have sent me <laughs> as the Father sent you. He said, the Father sent me, I now send you. He have sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. And that can be blind physical, but also blind spiritual. And set to liberty those who are bound. Can you say that? Is that a reality in your life? Can you say that he have, the Spirit of God is upon you because he has anointed you to preach the gospel to the poor, to send you to proclaim release to the captives, to recover to sight, to liberty to those who are bound? Can you say it or even more important? Can you do it? Do you do it? This is what the Spirit is doing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to sit in church. This is not what he said, was it? No, to not sit in church, but to sit, sit the captives free. Yes, of course, we should be in fellowship with other people. We are not called to live this life alone. I'm not saying against coming and sitting in church, but there is so many, many, many people who think God has given them the Holy Spirit to sit in church and not given the Holy Spirit to set the captives free. That is a good point here. Don't build on doctrines. Don't look at the person on your right side and your left side and think, oh, they don't do it like this, then don't do it like this. Okay, our church don't do like this, therefore it's not for that today. Then you are like a blind being led by blind. You need to take the word of God and read it yourself and take it from there and not take my word on it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. The spirit of God is upon you to set the captives free. The spirit of God is upon us to proclaim good news to the poor. We are all called to live like Christ. And we can only live like Christ. We can only obey Christ in his command if we have the spirit. We can also truly love people, only love people if we have the spirit. Because otherwise it's a selfish love. It's the spirit of God we need to really have that love in our communities. Romans 5, 5 is saying this. And hope doth not put us to shame because God's love have been poured out into our heart. How? Through the Holy Spirit who he had given us. So the love, God's love is poured out in our heart through the Spirit. Romans 15, 13 is saying this, I urge you, brother and sister, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, and so on. So it's by the love of the Spirit, the Spirit inside of us. It, without the Spirit, it can be difficult to love people sometimes. It can be difficult to love the poor, take care of those who are smelly and, and don't look the same way we look and talk different. We can feel we don't have anything in common with some of those people. But when we are full up of the love of God, by the Holy Spirit in us, we are able to love people. And, and I would say like this is only by the Spirit you are able to truly love people. Because otherwise the love you have will, will be, a, let's say like that, a selfish love. You love to get something back, but we love because he loved us first. And when the Spirit is coming over somebody, one of the first things you really see is how they just love people. How they love God and how they love people like they never ever loved people before. And if we look at this, we need the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
But the sad truth is that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit today have become in many churches the Father, the Son and the Holy Scripture. In many church denominations in America and all over the world, they don't have the experience of the power of the Holy Spirit in their midst. It's not the Father, Son and Holy Spirit anymore. It's the Father, Son, Holy Scripture. And it's so sad to see this. And there's many people like, like, like almost like, no, 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 don't, don't too much the Holy Spirit. It's only Jesus, only Jesus. And you know, yes, the, the main job of the Holy Spirit is to point on Jesus and remind us of every word Jesus has spoken. We're going to look at that later. But you have to understand, it's so crazy when you look at it. When Jesus was on earth and came to his, to the, his people, they rejected Jesus. They know Jesus, we don't want you. No, no, no. We, we don't want you. We want the Father. Only the Father. Only the Father. We worship the Father. And Jesus is like, okay, if, if you worship the Father, you will worship me. You will love me if you love the Father, like me and the Father are one. But, but they rejected Jesus and wanted the Father. But now Jesus is in heaven and it's the Holy Spirit who's down here. And now people, no, no, Holy Spirit, no, 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 Holy Spirit, no, 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 it's, it's, we, we only want Jesus, we don't want you, the Holy Spirit. It's almost like that. But he's the Spirit of Christ. Come on. And, and he is there to remind us and help us, what Je- remind us of Jesus' words and to point to Christ. But there is many people today, as I said, who have the Father, who have the Son, and who have the Holy Scripture. Those churches, those denominations where is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, scripture are lacking the love it's very religious and it's very judgmental and i see that i've been in fellowships where it's like so religious and so judgmental but love hide a multitude of sins love there is a lot of forgiveness and over you over i don't know things word there a lot of forgiveness toward each other hide a multitude of sins we, we love each other. We care. We don't see all the mistakes in each other. We are there to help each other. Not that people can live in willful sin, but you know, new people make mistakes and we just forgive them instead of pointing fingers. And what is wrong with those people? Because they don't have the love of Christ in them. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. So those places where we see Father, Son, Holy Scripture is no love. It's very religious and very judgmental. It's also powerless. There is no healings and there is no deliverance. And what have I just described here? A big, big part of the church in the world today. All over the world today. So that's why we need to talk about the Holy Spirit. We need to look at the Holy Spirit. People need to experience the Holy Spirit. Some of you will say, man, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but listen here, I have made Holy Spirit filled churches where there is no love. That may be correct. But sometimes we would then need to ask questions, do they truly have the Holy Spirit in them? Do they truly have the Holy Spirit in them if there is no love? I've also met Holy Spirit filled churches who have no power. And I would then ask Christian again, do they truly, truly have the Holy Spirit in them? Just because you are Pentecostal church don't mean you are Pentecostal. We believe in speaking tongues and we are talking about the gift of speaking tongues later, but it's much more than just speaking tongues. Speaking in tongues is one of the signs, signs you see that people receive the Spirit. But if the love and if the power is not following, uh, I want to ask Christian, I want to say a question mark to Is that truly, truly for God? Is that truly the Holy Spirit they have received? So don't build on that. There is a lot of fraud out there. There is a lot of things. Let's look at the scripture. So let's continue here. Luke, we looked at Luke 4, uh, 4 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news, to set the captive free and send me to uh, give sight to the blind. And it was what we saw in Jesus' life, those things he said. He showed how it looked like to walk by the Spirit. He showed that by walking in, led by the Spirit, by living in power of the Spirit, and by walking, a, living a holy life. And he was imitating the fruit of the Spirit. And we are going to look more on the fruit of the Spirit next time. Not only the power, but the fruit we read about, because the fruit of the Spirit should 
be there in our life. If we didn't do it the Spirit, then Jesus was living this life and showing us how to, to live it. And then he took his disciple beside and, and first time he really spoke clear about the Holy Spirit to them like that was when he talked about the river of living water should come up from inside of us. And he said that in Luke 7, sorry, in John 7, in John 7, Gospel of John 7, 38, he said this, He that believe in me, as the scripture have said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. But this spoke he of the spirit which they that believe on him were to receive. For the spirit had not yet given because these have not yet been glorified. And this is very, very important to understand what Jesus was saying here. Jesus said that him who believe in him, there should run, up, run live, like rivers of living water. There he spoke about the spirit, but which those who believe in him were to receive. They have not received the spirit because Jesus could not give the spirit because he had not yet been glorified. It was first after cross he went to heaven. He could send his spirit down here. So in the gospels, no one received the Spirit, the same way we do after the cross in Book of Acts. Because Jesus, the Spirit could not be given because Jesus had not been glorified. And that's very interesting because, you know, they, those big churches out there who talk about the Father, Son, Holy Scripture, who don't have experience with the Holy Spirit. One of the things is they don't love like the Book of Acts. They often throw the Book of Acts away. No, no, it's all about the Gospel, the Gospel, the Gospels. And what do you see? You see repentance in the gospel. And they talk a lot about repentance. But they don't understand the baptism and they don't receive the Holy Spirit. Because they're so focused on the gospel and they're so blind to the life after the cross. And, and it's so important to understand that the gospel, there was things you saw in the gospel and things you did not see in the gospel. One thing you did not see in the gospel is that you did not see people receive the Spirit. Like Christ did. Why? Because Christ had not yet been glorified and he could not give the Spirit. He could teach about it. So he could not give the Spirit. And that's also what, when he actually sent his disciples out, the 12 in Luke 9 and, and Matthew 10 and the 17 in Luke 10, he actually did not give them the Holy Spirit. In Luke 9, we read here, he called the 12 two disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure sickness. So when Jesus sent his disciples out, he did not give them the spirit. He gave them for this time, this moment, this season, power and authority over all demons and to cure sickness. But after he went to heaven, the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came and stayed in them, was there. And, and, and that, now the power and authority over all demons and to cure sickness is given to all of us by the Holy Spirit. But it was different that time. It was only for that season. So again, Jesus could not give the Spirit in the gospel because... He had not yet been glorified, but he could talk about the Spirit. And he spoke a lot about the Spirit with them, or with us. And one of the, some of the chapters is chapter 14, John 14, and John 16. Chapter, and we're going to look a little at them. So 14, John 14, he talked about the promise of the Spirit. And he said this in verse 15, If you love me, you keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither see him or know him, but you know him for he live with you and will be in you. There's so much in these words we are going to look at. One thing that is important, I will start with the last phrase here. You know him for he live with you and will be in you. Jesus, the Holy Spirit was with them, but he was not in them. 
when Jesus gave them power and authority, it was the Holy Spirit working with them. But the Holy Spirit was not in them. What you need to understand is that no one can come to God unless the Holy Spirit draws that person. So coming to Christ is a work by the Spirit. Repentance is a work by the Spirit. No one can see the sins unless the Holy Spirit really reveals that. And the Holy Spirit is working in repentance. Baptism is water is a work of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is working in all of us. The Holy Spirit is was working in the disciples at that time. But there is a difference between having the Holy Spirit with us or working in our life and then having the Spirit in us or being baptized with the Spirit or receive the Spirit or be full of the Spirit. So there is a big difference here. And, and I, I met many people today like, oh, I have the Holy Spirit. I don't think so. I, I don't see that in your life. Where is the power that is showing that you have the Spirit? I don't see you walking that. No, but I have the Holy Spirit. No, I, I don't see that. Also, where is your love? Like something is missing here. Yeah, but I know because something has changed in my life. Okay, yeah, God is already working in you by the Spirit. But he's a different. Like my father-in-law, amazing guy, Eichel, he was actually leader in a church. They had a house church, and he was one of the leaders. He had been standing behind a pulpit and been preached about Jesus many times. And he loved Jesus. But when the Holy Spirit came in him, when he got baptized by the Holy Spirit, every, 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 everything changed. Everything changed. And I've seen that in so many people who have a love for people who have repented. But when the Holy Spirit come into them, everything is just changing. And, and we're going to look more at that in the next lesson where I'm going to look at the early church and what the Holy Spirit was doing in the early disciples. Like Peter, like... Very short. Take Peter before Pentecost. Oh, Jesus, I'm never going to deny you. But what did we see after Pentecost? We saw a totally different Peter. What, what is the difference between Peter before and Peter after? Was it the 50 days or 53 days? No, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. If your life is more like Peter before Pentecost, then you don't have the Spirit of God in you. That is how it should be. If, or you're not full by the Spirit. You need to be full of the Spirit because then you'll be like Peter after Pentecost. And we are going to look at that later. He was teasing Jesus. And one of the things he also said here, uh, I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter. A comforter, a helper. Another comforter. The word another means not, it's not another of a different kind. It's another of the same kind. Let's say you have an apple and I take away your apple and I say, I will give you another fruit and I give you an orange. You get another, but it's another of a different kind. It's not an apple anymore, it's an orange. It's another fruit you got. It's another at a different kind. But here is another of the same kind. So we take one apple and we give you another apple. So it's the same kind. Jesus went away to send us another comforter. Like him. The same kind. And he continues here in verse 18. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you as orphans, he said. And then he said, I will come to you. But is it Jesus who are coming back to them? Or is it his spirit? It is Jesus, but by his spirit, Christ in us. So Jesus came back. He's already here, not in his body, but in his spirit, he is here. And then he said, I will not leave you orphans. They have been walking with Christ 
for three years. And Jesus said, I leave you, but I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you alone. I will come again. I will send another, the same kind as me, the spirit of Christ in us. And when we talk about orphans, you know, orphans is someone who don't have parents. The spirit of the father is also called the spirit of God. When we receive the spirit in us, we are not longer orphans. We are sons. We got sonship, sons of daughters of the most high. And it's really a beautiful thing. There is an adoption taking place when people receive the Holy Spirit. And talk about boldness. That is where boldness come in when you really understand that I am a son. I am a daughter of the Most High. I am adopted. He is my father. And this is what we read in, in Roman 8. Roman 8 here, he said here, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slave, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testify with our spirit that we are the children of God. When the spirit comes, Adoption are taking place. The Spirit cry out, Abba, Father. It is beautiful. Many people read a word like that and think with the mind, this is beautiful, and try to understand it with the head. You need to have this in your spirit. It's not a, it's just, it's not theology, please. Word of God is not theology, it's life. This, what we read, should be manifested into our life. I remember after I met God, I had a father, an earthly father. It was not always easy. He, uh, he was working a lot and I was not very close to him. And I met God and they did not understand it. My parents and thought I was crazy. But then I remember one day the Holy Spirit just came. And I was say like, whoa. The Holy Spirit was in me, but it just revelation came with it. And I just started to cry and cry and cry. Ah, are you okay, Tom? Yeah, I think so. What is happening? I don't know. And I was just crying and crying and crying. And what happened there, I felt this adoption as sonship. From that day on, God is my father, Abba Father. Something changed in my relationship with my father. And it's not something you just read about, something you need to experience. Have you not experienced it? Take time and see God and take these words in Romans 8 and meditate on it and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it in you. This is how it should be. And, and when I experienced that, it just, it just changed everything in my life. It really changed me. And, and I got a boldness and a relationship with my father and I, uh, in heaven I, I never had before. And I experienced a healing at the same time with my earthly father. So it was really, really beautiful. So this is what the Spirit do in us. And again, if you don't have those experiences, there is a big chance you don't have the Spirit. It's just how it is. But you can get the Spirit. Stay with me here. John 16, he continues, and, and John 16, he continues where he speak about the Spirit. And he actually start with this. Listen here, I'm telling you the truth, or however I tell you the truth in John 16, 7. Why do he say this? Why do Jesus need to say, hey guys, I am going to tell you the truth now. What I'm saying now is the truth. I'm not lying. It is the truth what I'm going to say to, now, to you right now. Why did Jesus need to say that? Hey, hey guys, I am telling you the truth right now. What? Like Jesus was often lying. Jesus never lied. So why do he needed to say that what he was going to say now was the truth? Because everything Jesus said was the truth. The reason he said it was because what he was going to say to them was so difficult to understand. And what he was going to say to them is difficult to understand. Also for many today, 
but it is the truth. And he said here, it is for your advantage or it is the best for you that I'm going away. Because if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus said, I am saying the truth to you. It's difficult to understand, but what I'm going to say is the truth. And that is, is the best for you that I go away. It is to your advances that I go away. And people are like, no, Jesus, no, we need you here, Jesus. You, we need you, Jesus, because we have a lot of Christians and, and we want to see the miracles and, and we, we want to walk with you and, and we want to spend time with you, Jesus. We need you. No, no, it's the best I go away. No, no, Jesus, because there are people need healing, there's people need deliverance, there's people who have a lot of need, Jesus. We need you. No, it's the best I go away because if I don't go away, I cannot send my spirit to you. It is the best that Jesus went away. Why? Because then we, also you and me today, can have fellowship with him 24-7. If Jesus was on earth today, you could not have fellowship with him. You had to jump in a plane and go to Israel to meet him. And there would be a billion other people also want to meet Jesus. And he needs to sleep and go to the toilet. So you cannot meet him. But it was the best he go away because we had the Holy Spirit with us, but now he would be in us. The spirit of Christ in us. And it's so difficult to understand. And there's so many people and somehow some, oh, oh, try to dream about walking with Jesus here on earth. And seeing him doing the miracles and just experience that. And yes, that could be beautiful. But he said it was the best that he go away. Because now he can be in us. And work through us. It is truly the best that Jesus went away because we can experience this true life and this true fellowship. And the fellowship by the Spirit is so much more than what most people understand. I often think of this Paul. He was the one who said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. If you look at Paul's life who have written many of the letters in the New Testament. It almost looked like Paul, he knew Christ better than John James, Peter and the rest. But what was the difference between Paul's life and John James and Peter and the rest? John James and Peter walked with Christ. They asked questions. They ate with him. They went in his house. They saw miracles. They were sent out by him and came back to him. They had Q&A with Jesus. They walked with him for three years. Paul never did that. He never saw Jesus here on earth in his own body. He never saw Jesus heal a sick, cast out a demon. He never talked with Jesus at Q and A. But how could Paul, why was it not John, James, and Peter who said, "Imitate me as I imitate Christ"? How do how could Paul look so much like Christ when he had never walked with Jesus and seen Jesus in the flesh and put his hand in the side like Thomas by the Spirit? By the Spirit. The way Paul walked with Christ, we can walk with Christ today by the Spirit. Imitate Paul as he imitated Christ. And it's so beautiful. And I often like, what is the secret, Paul? I know he's spoken in tongues that anyone else, that may be one of the secrets. We'll talk about that next time. But it's so beautiful that we by the Spirit can have a relationship with Christ, relationship with our Father who's in heaven. And the Spirit is crying out, Abba, Father. And if that is not your the reality in your life and the church goers around you, it's because you lack the Spirit. Or you need to really understand what God has given you a walk in it. So I hope you get a little idea of what the Holy Spirit is and start to get a hunger for the Spirit of Christ. For the Spirit, as Jesus spoke a lot about. The question is, when do people receive the Spirit? And we want to talk about that. And, and this can be a little technical for some of you. But I want you to really stay with me. Because this is powerful. When you understand, it's just like, ding, light. And you're like, whoa, this is beautiful. 
the, most people will say that the apostle received his spirit in John 20, 21. After Jesus died, he rose up again. And we read here, and Jesus came and he appeared himself for his disciples and they were overwhelmed by joy. And then in John 20, 21, Jesus told him, peace be with you, just as the Father sent me, I'm now sending you. When he said that, he breathed on them or blew on them and told them, receive the spirit. The normal Pentecostal teaching is that in this moment, they received the spirit because he blew on them and said, receive the spirit. And then they received the spirit or was born by the spirit. And then in Acts, we read how the spirit, they got baptized by the spirit. So there is like a receiving the spirit and being baptized by the spirit. I've been, I have believed that myself for years and I have been teaching that for years. And I have been saying to other people who said something else that they were wrong. But uh, I found out that they were right and I was wrong. And what I've been teaching for years was wrong. Um, what I believe now is that they did not receive the spirit there. A few words before we read it, Jesus told to them, don't hold on me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. He had not yet at that time been glorified. He had not yet gone to the Father. So the Holy Spirit was not yet sent here on earth. So therefore, no one at this time could receive the Holy Spirit. He said it very clearly already before he needed to go away to the Father so the Spirit could come down here. At this time, when he breathed on them and said, receive the spirit, nothing happened. You don't read anything happened. You don't read the receive the spirit spoken tongues or something happened. They could not receive the spirit. I think that what Jesus said here was a picture of what he, he wanted to do. Because here he breathed on them. He blew on them. And then said, receive the spirit. But after he did that, it's not written there, but in the context of this time, we read what he also said. And you read that in Acts 1. If you go to Acts 1 and read there for verse 3, after his suffering, Jesus showed himself alive on many occasions over a period of 40 days and telling them about the kingdom of God. So here we read again that Jesus after the cross, over 40 days, he spent time with them and tell them about the kingdom of God. While he was meeting with them, that could be in the same context we just read before, but while he was meeting at them, he ordered them, do not leave Jerusalem. Instead, wait for what my father promised about which I, you have heard me speak. So when he was with them, he commanded them to not leave Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father had promised. And what was that? There was the Spirit. So when he blew on them, they did not receive the Spirit at that time. Why? Because they, he had not yet ascended to heaven. He blew on them as an example for what will come. And then he said, wait in Jerusalem for what my Father had promised that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days from now, or you will receive the Spirit in a few days from now. Come back to that. And then he went to heaven. And then from heaven, he blew again. And as a mighty wind, as a mighty wind, Jesus blow from heaven. The Holy Spirit came and Fill them all up. That is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. We're going to read it very soon. That is so beautiful. So here you see the picture of the Holy Spirit in Christ and what he was teaching. John 14 and John 16. How he needed to die. He needed to rise up. He needed to be glorified. Go to heaven. So he could send his Holy Spirit down here. And he blow on them. But they did not receive. He said to them, wait. And then he went for heaven and from heaven he blew on them. And there they received the Holy Spirit or got baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want to show a little more of that. I want to end up with this. 
with, with the whole thing of Jesus blowing from heaven down. This is beautiful. In John 3, John 3, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And I believe that is the water and the spirit of God. The baptism with water and baptism with the Holy Spirit. I talked about that in the last lesson. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel when I tell you that you must be born from above. And then he said these words here. You have to look at this. The wind blows where it wants to. You hear it sounds, but you don't know where it comes from and where it is going. That's the way it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. I want to show you something amazing here I saw some years ago. The word here, the wind, the strong concordance is G4151. That is the word, the Greek word that is used for wind. But if you go in the same words here, the last word, spirit, is also G4151. It is the same Greek word that is used in the same words here in John 3.8. The same Greek word G4151 is one place translated with wind and the other way place translated with spirit. If you then go and do a search in ESORT, for example, in the Strongs, you will see that this word G4151, I don't want to try to pronounce the word because I'm, I, I think I would do it wrong if I do that. So I just give you the number. That Greek word, is 385 times in the New Testament. 385 times you see this word. And you know how many times is translated with wind. Out of 385 times is only translated with wind one time. In this, this words, words we just read. Why did they translate it with wind? I don't know, but I want to say that it is a bad translation. It should not be wind. It should not be the wind blows. It should be the spirit. Stay with me. The wind blows. Another that could be translated with brief. The wind, the spirit, brief. Stay with me. The sound, the word, the sound, you hear the sound thereof. The sound could be voice. Thank God for Wycliffe translation. Wycliffe is a beautiful Bible translation. The old 1942 Wycliffe translation had it right. This is the famous Wycliffe translation of the Bible. Listen to the same words here. I will actually read it from the beginning. John 5, John 3, 5. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to thee, but a man be born again of water and of the Holy Ghost. He may not enter into the kingdom of God. Is born of the flesh is flesh, and that that is born of the spirit is spirit. Wonder thou not, for I say to thee that behold, you may be born again. And then it comes, the spirit breathe it. Breathe where he will. And thou hearest their voice, the voice of the Spirit. But thou dost not where he comes and where he goes. So it is each man that is born of the Spirit. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Jesus said you need to be born again to enter into the kingdom of God out of water and spirit. You need to be adopted as sons by the spirit in you. That's crying out, Abba, Father. Spirit is the adoption. And then he walked with his disciples and he blew on them and said, receive the spirit, but they didn't. 
because he could not give the spirit. Why? Because he had not yet been glorified. But then he went to heaven and from heaven he blew the spirit of Christ. <sighs> he blew from heaven and the spirit came and the spirit breathed where it wants and you hear the voice of the spirit they were all crying out and you see that and that was the same thing when peter saw in Acts 10 that the gentiles have exper have received the gospel when he heard and spoke in tongues that was what convinced peter that the salvation was not only for the jews but also for the gentiles when he heard the voice of the spirit when they were crying abba father when they were speaking in new tongues the spirit breathed where he wants you hear the voice you do not know where it comes from where it goes but this is for all men for everyone who is born of the spirit let's read how it happened X2. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seems like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest of each of them. And they were all filled by the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues or language as the Spirit enabled them. The voice of the Spirit. And then Peter, he replied when he stood up later. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall also receive, is what he's saying. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because this promise, the promise Jesus had been talking about. We read about in John 14 and 16 is for you and your children and for all who are far off and all whom the Lord our God will call. The promise Jesus spoke about, the promise Ezekiel say here, I will give them a new heart and put my spirit in you. I will remove the stone heart from you and give you a heart of flesh. The promise uh, Jeremiah spoke about. Uh, Joel spoke about that he pour out his spirit in the end days. Hallelujah. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision and your old men will dream dreams. Hallelujah. This is for us today. I think it's beautiful. Here you see the Spirit, how he came on Jesus and how he walked in the power of the Spirit. How he walked with authority to, to proclaim the gospel to the poor and give sight to the blind and set the captives free. And how he was demonstrating that and, and showing that. And then how he talked to his disciples that it was the best that I go away and when the Spirit will come upon us. And uh, and we saw that, and he went from from died on the cross, got buried, rose up again, went to heaven, and from heaven he blew one more time, and um, as a mighty wind, the Holy Spirit came and filled all of them, and they got completely changed and transformed, and you heard the voice of the Spirit, and this is for everyone who is born again. Let this not just be a theology. Let this not be something you just read about, study about, hear about, dream about. Let this be the reality in your life. It is the reality in my life. It is the reality in many people's life. We experience boldness. We experience the Abba Father. We experience the prophecy. We experience the vision. We experience the dreams. We experience the authority to cast out demons. We experience the power to heal the sick we experience to be led by the holy spirit we experience the love to other people we experience the the holy spirit as a reality in our life let the holy spirit be a reality in your life i think it's beautiful next time i'm going to uh, speak more about uh, peter john and peter and paul and We are going to continue in the book of Acts and see the chains of the early church and, and more practical what the Holy Spirit do and how to receive the Holy Spirit. 
and we are going to look at that next time. I would just pray for you right now. That God, I thank you for this word. I thank you for your teaching, Jesus. I thank you for the Holy Spirit, God, that, that today is the day of salvation. We don't need to stay in Jerusalem and wait. The Holy Spirit is here. Holy Spirit, come over those people who hear this word. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and fill them up right now. God, let them ask and pray and seek you to receive the Holy Spirit. God, come with your Holy Spirit, oh, everyone who hear this word, God. God, let them not stop. Let them not stop. Let them continue on to they receive the Spirit. God, come with your Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and teach us the truth and let the truth set us free. And God, we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and fill people up, God. Come with your Holy Spirit, God. Come, Holy Spirit, oh, everyone who's here this, God. God, come and restore and take away all doctrines of man and lies of the church, God. And, and let us see the truth in your word, God. Let us see it and let us experience it, God. Come with your Holy Spirit, oh, everyone, in the name of Jesus, God. I'm excited. I'm excited for this, Holy Spirit. I am excited. Uh, share this video, please. Share this video. Share the teaching here. Share it. Get it out to people. Spread it. People need the Holy Spirit. People need the true gospel. Some people... A stark they don't understand what repentance is. Some people are stark don't understand true faith. Some people are stark don't understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a water. Some people are stark don't understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit or how to receive the Spirit. We need it all. So uh, this is the next teaching in the series. Next time I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit in the early disciples and Holy Spirit in us. And we are going to continue in Acts 2. Uh, X1 actually and X2 and move on from there so so it all become uh, one full story and next time we are going to be even more practical if you have questions to this teaching you can also ask them here uh, and then I will uh, bring some of them up in the next teaching God bless you all out there share this teaching bye bye